So we begin our service with a call to service and we ring this bowl. And as I was tearing down 213 this morning, I thought, ooh, what am I gonna say when I ring the bowl? And I said, well, the theme of today is hold the center. And I thought, what a nice feeling of holding the center when you hold the bowl. And I thought about all the times in our lives we hold a bowl, a bowl of soup on a cold winter day, the big bowl of mashed potatoes that you carry to the holiday dinner table, even the secret bowl of snacks that you're really not supposed to have that you kind of go off with the chips and nobody sees you. But so delicious and so comforting and so homey. Wouldn't it be great if we could hold our own centers with that kind of homey confidence? So I encourage you in the moment of silence that we will have to hold your own center in that calm, homey confidence. You have a center, you can hold it. And this community has a center and we can hold it. Welcome, good morning. Welcome members, friends, and visitors to the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River, where our mission is to inspire, inform, and support all those who seek spiritual and personal growth <laughs> and a more equal and just community. We're glad with you. We're glad you're here with us this morning and the folks and the folks on the Zoom feed. My name is Marilee Tausig. We're very lucky to have Joe Holt who stepped in Joe with Holt. little notice to give us music this morning. And of course, we're also equally lucky to have Reverend Sue Browning with us this special Sunday. It's special for a variety of reasons, but one is that it is the kickoff for our stewardship campaign. Um, just a couple of announcements. There's an offering basket in the lobby. So this would be in non-COVID times, the time we pass the basket, but we don't do that anymore. So if you would have put something in the basket, it's waiting for you longingly out there in the lobby. And for those of you on Zoom, um, there's a donate button on the website. If you're visiting for the first time, Please sign our guest book in the lobby and the rest of you have probably done your little check mark next to your name so we know you were here.
And um, in announcements I forgot to submit, even though I was here early, uh, we do have a book discussion this afternoon on Stacey Abrams' book, Our Time Is Now. So that's on Zoom. We light our chalice this morning with the common words that are familiar to this congregation. When a Unitarian Universalist church gathers, I'm get it. When a Unitarian Universalist church gathers, we often light a chalice as the way we sing, symbol to signal to one another that for this gathering for right now, this group will never exactly be together again. We have these words. We light this chalice as a symbol of the light within all creation. We light this chalice for truth. May the search for truth be with us always. We light this chalice for love. May the love for others be strong in our hearts. Thank you, Joe. For our opening words, I'm going to share from my favorite Christmas gift I got from my daughter. Um, this is Amanda Gorman, you guys may remember. And um, the title is Call Us What We Carry. And it's pretty much a poetry of the pandemic. I can't recommend it more highly. Um, but bring tissues if you buy it. I'm going to read from a poem called Fugue, and I'm going to read a shortened version of it because we didn't have enough tissues. <laughs> Don't get us wrong. We do pound for what has passed, but more so all that we passed by. Unthanking, unknowing, when what we had was ours. There was another gap that choked us, the simple gift of farewell, goodbye, by which we say to one another, thanks for offering your life into mine. By goodbye, we truly mean, let us be able to say hello again. 
This is edgeless doubt. Every cough seemed catastrophe. Every proximate person a potential peril. We mapped each sneeze and sniffle, certain the virus we had run away from was now running through us. We were already thousands of deaths into the year every time we fell heart first into the news, head first, dread first, our bodies tight and tensed with what now? Yet who has the courage to inquire, what if? What hope shall we shelter within us like a secret second smile, private and pure? Sorry if we're way less friendly, we've had COVID trying to end things. Even now, handshakes and hugs are like gifts, something we're shocked to grant or be granted. And we forage for anything that feels like this. The click in our lung that ties us to strangers, how when among those we care for most, we shift with instinct like the flash of a school of fish. Our regard for one another, not tumored, just transformed. By hello, we mean, let us not say goodbye again. There is someone we would die for. Feel that fierce unshifting truth, that braced and ready sacrifice. That's what love does. It makes a fact based beyond fear. We have lost too much to lose. We lean against each other again, the way water bleeds into itself. This glassed hour paused, burst like a loaded star belonging always to us. What more must we believe in? Right, sorry. Well, I think, okay, yeah. Um, many of you know um, that sadly, Carl Gallegos and his wife, Brenda, will be moving out of the area later this week. So this is Carl's last service with us for a while, although, you know, you're always welcome back as a visitor. Um, so on behalf of the board and the congregation, I just wanted to bid you farewell. Um, for those who don't are newer to our congregation, Carl came here from Annapolis, right? The or Washington DC, sorry. In 2000. Yes, well, I was gonna I was gonna wait till yeah. I'll put my hearing aids back in and pop that with my mask. Um, so Carl moved here in 2004. Um, had been an active UU in Washington and immediately said, you don't have a green sanctuary committee here? What is that? <laughs> and we all kind of said, what's the green sanctuary? Well, that's our environmental concerns. And so he set about forming one and was chair for many years and slowly but surely led us to our green sanctuary certification uh, that we earned in June of 2007. And like many of us, um, Carl has worn many hats in your time with us, obviously chair of Green Sanctuary Committee, um, vice president, president for two years, um, an advocate for Unitarian Universalism in his um, involvement in the community with both Washington College, the Chester River Health Foundation presidency, um, always out there. Carl's background, as many of you know, is in forestry and sustainable development. And that love of his and his background, he has brought to this congregation. 
over the years. And, and that has really informed many of the activities, um, Earth Day, environmental concerns, climate change, that this congregation has taken to heart. And his passion for trees and forests was one of the catalysts for our memorial forest, which you can't see, but out, out there. Uh, and, and Diane Shields as um, but part of the building and grounds committee, they were really um, behind the planning and the execution of that beautiful memorial wood that started as such little trees and now it's really truly a forest. So I think I can speak for all of us here when we I say, Carl, that we will miss you. Uh, we have so appreciated having you as a member of this congregation, we know that I'm sure the UU congregation in Frederick will be happy and lucky to have you join them. We wish you and Brenda heartfelt wishes for health and happiness in your new home and meeting lots of new interesting people. But we don't want you to forget us here and or the legacy that you have left us in the woodland. So Brenda said, you might have a little bit of wall space <laughs> in your new place. For this picture of part of the Memorial Woodland, it was taken by David Beeler. And David uh, also took many photos, which are here in this portfolio. And you will notice that you can open the back of this picture frame mm -hmm. and you'll be able to change photos if you oh, would like sure. to see some different, different nice. views and venues. So with that here, why don't I, I'll keep it and package it. Okay. But we appreciate all you've done. We will miss you, bon voyage, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and we have to see you back. Well, thank you for those kind words, Nancy. As I stand here, I look at this building, which so many of us put so much effort into building to establish our church here. And I actually recall when John LaFerla and I were up in those skylights painting there. And actually, uh, to take you back a bit, um, when my wife Sheila and I were thinking of moving to the Eastern Shore, we hadn't decided on what, what community we wanted to live in. But when we came to Chestertown and we saw the sign downtown in the town square, but the, the UU meeting place in downtown Chestertown. And that was a deciding factor for Sheila and I to move to Chestertown and live here to be a member of this church. And uh, most of you know, that my wife uh, contracted cancer. It was actually a malignant melanoma. And um, UUCR broke ground on this church shortly after she was diagnosed. Sadly for us, but fortunately also, she died eight weeks after she was diagnosed. So she never got a chance to be in this church. We had just broken ground uh, when she was diagnosed. But this community and this church served me well during that time. Because many is the day I spent the entire day here, sanding the walls, painting, doing things, to keep myself busy because I didn't want to go home. But um, UUCR has seen me through a lot of difficulties and um, I will always treasure having been here 
and calling this my church home. And as the Native Americans say, uh, I go, you stay. Don't say goodbye. But in actuality, I certainly hope that in the future, I will have an opportunity to come back and replace the American chestnut tree that died. We planted two of them in memory of Dick Hawkins. There was an experiment, it still is. But the American, one of those trees has died. We're gonna to have to replace it. And I hope to be able to come back here to replace that tree that died with a genetically engineered American chestnut tree that could survive the blight. I hope I'm able to do that. Thank you all. It's been a great pleasure being a member of this church. I think we've had our prayer. We've had our stewardship speech, Carl. <laughs> I think the music, this moment together, thinking about our center is why we're here today. So we transition now to an important part of our service where we share our personal joys and concerns, our acknowledgments of the heart. And we do so gathered here in this special place on this special morning. We now hold this space. We hold the candles in love as we are graced by Joe's music once again.
share that when uh, Joe stepped in, when Barbara couldn't make it as a musician, he said, here's a list. And I couldn't manage to take anything off the list so we get lots of music. <laughs> it, it was like, oh, this will fit here. This will be great. So thank you for being a part of our stewardship morning, our pledge morning. And it's a place where we get to really feel our center and the holy. So I start with this premise today that humans are generous creatures. There's lots of studies out there and we'll start with that as our belief. I did need to look up the meaning of the word generous and the meaning I'm, I'm going with is a readiness to give more of something as money or time than is strictly needed or expected, strictly necessary or expected. So by that standard, paying your electric bill is not a generous act. Paying the bill is a fair thing to do. It's a fair act. You're paying for a service provided and it's good to meet your obligations and pay your bills. It's necessary and it's expected. Generosity comes. Maybe uh, you know, you're out to dinner, you're out to lunch with a friend and you usually split the bill and whatever. And it's not your pattern you say, you know, I'd just like to pay today. And the friend, you see that little look of gratitude and excitement, just something a little bit different. Maybe you mow your neighbor's yard just to help. Maybe you bake as a congregation over 1,000 cookies. <laughs> that actually happened last week. Put them in little red containers and pass them out and have that moment where there's a feeling of generosity, both of your time and coming back. And then there's the generosity. When you send a get well card, when you send a sympathy card, I think in these times you're bringing pleasure or comfort and you're noticing the wants of another. Clearly it's something more than is strictly necessary or expected. So today we're gonna to talk about our religious home and giving to the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River. And when I'm done, my goal is for you to be really, really excited to submit your pledge. <laughs> really excited. I'm hoping you're going to want to surprise the congregation with a new, fresh pledge that's based in generosity and love. And I think if there's one thing, one, there's many things the pandemic taught me. We're going to hear a little bit about those today. But one of the things I've learned is we need to be a little more direct, a little more honest. So I want to start talking about money right here because finances are both personal and they're part of a larger whole. Over the last two years, the stock market has gone way up. If you measure it last Friday, it's gone up about 16% over two years. If I had done it two weeks earlier, it might've been 25%. There's been dips, but there's no doubt that it has gone up. That affects some here. Not everybody, because some people have assets that are in the market, some don't, but we know the stock market's high. For some folks, not everybody here, there was $3,000 in pandemic relief. You got some checks, if you're a couple, maybe you got $6,000. There was a limit to those based on your income, so not everybody got checks, but some did. Social security is up 5.9%, it's up there. So that's some of what's happened financially, but we also know that many have experienced unemployment. There have been notable decreases in income. Maybe you own a business or work in a restaurant, or maybe one of your family members do, and you maybe you've had to help a struggling family member. There has been a lot of hardship. We've traveled less, we've eaten less. The last two years, have included all these financial realities. And what's interesting is in the United States, what has happened to generous giving? The United States is topping out. People are giving more money than they've ever given before. It is breaking records all over the place. I think the number was almost $500 billion. So I've been thinking about why is it why is it during a pandemic with all the financial stuff, yeah, some people have some money to give away, some people are struggling, why are the numbers up so far? I think people want to share. People are living generously and 
their hearts have been stretched open over these last two years. And I'm sure many here have been part of this generosity. During the pandemic, I have witnessed generosity in forms I had never imagined. I see church in a new way, and I see my own role in a new way. When we opened the service today, we noted that this congregation's mission is to inspire, inform, and support all who seek a spiritual and personal growth and a more equal and just community. How had we been doing this pre-pandemic? How did we do and live into that mission? Well, we gathered. That was our job. We prided ourselves on being a center of transforming hearts and minds. And we did it Sunday by Sunday, potluck by potluck, community project by community project. Wherever there were two or more gathered, you know a Unitarian Universalist would be part of that group. We are a very, very social people. Our focus as a congregation was to lay the table to create these chances for gatherings. And then the pandemic turned our lives upside down. I'm picturing a roller coaster or a tilt-a-whirl at the amusement park. Whichever one upsets your stomach more, picture that one. Some people don't like to go around. Some people don't like it to go up and down. When you are being tossed up and down, your center is shifting. You lose your orientation. And at an amusement park, this is all by design. But the other thing about an amusement park is it lasts two minutes not two years. So when we started on that ride in March, 2020, and it was not by design, we thought we might not be able to gather for a week, maybe a month. I remember writing those letters with David Bueller. We don't wanna scare folks too much, but we might have to tell them about eight weeks. We've got a few students visiting today that are in confirmation classes in other churches. I'm guessing when your schools shut down, you weren't expecting when you were two years younger, this was going to happen quite this way. But during these last two years, we've peeled back what it means to gather. We substituted heartfelt recordings for services. We figured out YouTube and Zoom. We heard from some of you that these services don't just work for us. And we worried, the leaders of the congregation, we all worried about losing connections. And we tried more options. We gathered in the parking lot. We burned socks in the parking lot. <laughs> we found time to be in the beautiful memorial garden you can see out there that Carl helped found. We went, came back in September, we went hybrid. We've got cameras, we've got all sorts of stuff. As a congregation, you have kept on keeping on week after week, month after month. You have held your center. New roles emerged over this time. We have tech teams. Some of us became film stars. <laughs> you look at me and Annie and Nancy and Meryl Lee. We did not want to put ourselves on camera. We did not want to record that and then share it with the first billion people who happened to want to look and yet anyone can see us on camera. We allowed the center to shift some so that we would still have a center. Your board met and then they met again. Committees met, Zoom became routine and the center shifted some more, but it hung together. Jan left, went on big adventures traveling and Darlene was hired. We switched our entire staff of one. <laughs> Your old board shifted out. David Beeler hung in there for two years and past president Carl hung in there and said, I'll do stewardship one more year and Jim Lavin and everybody did it. And we've got his new stewardship team now. Nancy bravely stepped up and stepped in. We were learning over this two years and I say this about our church, but I say this about other places as well, that our center was pretty darn sturdy as long as we let it keep widening. As long as we let the circle widen and had new ideas and new people, we could keep it stable or stable enough. There's a saying from one of my colleagues, Reverend Teresa Soto. She says, we all need all of us to make it. Think about that. We all need all of us to make it. 
And this was especially true as this congregation has felt losses, as the congregation encircled those who needed care and support. We assured that that joys and concerns that you just witnessed happening, that that happened in some way every single week. So what have we learned about the essence of being a congregation, about the essence of our shared purpose? What have we learned? I've got it down to three lessons. You may have more. Please talk about them as we go. Lesson one, relationships sustain us in times of challenge and unpredictability. It matters that we each have a few places of belonging in our lives that are grounded in explicit commitments to one another. These can be your family relationships, but we also long for substantive commitments and connections in the community. We don't stumble into these commitments of care. Relationships need to be developed and nurtured. This congregation, UUCR, is an intentional group that is continually welcoming those seeking connection. We are intentionally open for those looking for healing, for those looking for partners on the journey. We care for one another and we are a community standing ready for those we've yet to meet. This is part of living into our mission. This is the compassion that is at our center. Lesson two, we are a creative and resilient lot. We, each of us personally, and we as a congregation, and I have no doubt that the pandemic has taken a toll on us and our families. It's worn us down in ways we know, worn us down in ways we're still uncovering, in ways we're never gonna quite get. We found grace in the slower pace and lighter calendars, sort of, but we're mostly tired people of doing things differently. We worry about isolation, the impact on our children and more, but through it all, absolutely amazingly, we have creatively found paths of connection and moments of joy. We've shared our pain with honesty and we've modeled for one another, the adaptation that it needs to be a resilient people. We've opened up in new ways. At times, we've just absolutely surprised ourselves. Our shared values ground that part of our mission. We've creatively, creatively charted new ways to live into our values. This creativity is at our center. So lesson three, we have learned to give more freely and lean into generosity. During the pandemic, our empathy has grown. We are ready, even more ready to share our joy with others. We wanna reduce the angst and the distress where we can, and we know better how to listen. Because I think we've learned how quickly life can shift. I think we've each had personal examples of that throughout our lives, but now we know our collective lives can shift. And I hope what that does is draws us to the present moment. What is possible right now in this moment? And to trust that the next pieces will unfold somehow. We're ready to share more money or time than is strictly necessary or expected because we can. This generosity is at our center. So as you go through your stewardship campaign in 2022, as we go through this, I don't have any doubt that UUCR will collect, connect enough money to keep going, it's good. But I also sense that this year is unique. We have a refreshed sense of identity after these last two years. We are a special catalyst in the world for emerging needs. We boldly gave grants as a congregation. You gave money just because you had extra to Maneri's Dream and Kent Attainable Housing. These are actions you'd never done before, but you just did it because you had some extra. So as we're frank today about money, 
my hope is that you'll pause and look at your pledge card. And if you've pledged early, please know addendums are accepted. <laughs> please do not feel locked in to your past amount or what you've already submitted. What would it feel like to make a bold and daring pledge this year? Because I, I ask this, because while we're laying it all out there, the reality is people do not always consider congregations like they consider other charities. The charities for food, the charities for specific diseases, really worthwhile things, they're soaring up there. But I think sometimes people think of their congregation a bit more like their electric bill. When we look at these lessons of the pandemic, at our purpose to be a hub for relationships, at our purpose to be a saving force for the next person needing a comfortable seat and message, at our platform of figuring out what is needed, where we can be creative and resilient. It's these lessons that the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River are such a dynamic force. We pledge to bring these lessons alive this is what pledging is about. It's true that it pays for your staff of one and your minister and your facilities, and it pays for your connection to other Unitarian Universalists. It is how you are living into that message to inspire, inform, and support all who seek spiritual and personal growth in a more equal and just community. As a congregation, we model generosity, we teach generosity. And I'm hoping your pledge just feels daring, it feels bold, it encompasses these lessons. Your pledge is a, it's gratitude for what's been, but here's what it really is. It's paying it forward. It's paying forward these lessons learned. So this foundation will continue to be strong. The pandemic cracked us open, friends. The lessons I hope encourage us to be more direct, more honest, more immediate, and to not hold back. We can't predict the future, but we can prepare to face it together as a strong, resilient, open, and loving community. Let this be the way that we live out our readiness to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. May it be so, and blessed be. Whew. Another sermon, ser sermon checked off for pledging. It was actually a blessing to just to be able to write that, to get that part out of my heart, because you are an amazing, amazing community. And I'm gonna invite, I think it might be easier if she comes up to the pulpit. Your stewardship committee is now gonna sort of give a brief update of some of the things they're thinking about. And then we will hear a little bit more music from Joe. So, Catherine? Have my collection. So, here I am again. I was here last Sunday. Oh, I was here last Sunday, and I'm back. Um, I am representing the Stewardship Committee, and they're, it's a small group, but it's very active. And before I go into talking about that, I wanted to share my experience with this church. Um, I came to Chestertown probably 40 years ago when my parents retired here. And I was in graduate school and I would go back and forth. And then I disappeared for about 10 years. And in the meantime, I met my husband, Ted Ramsey, John's brother. And this was, I guess, maybe mid eighties. And I thought Chestertown's a pretty cool town. So when we, Ted and I got married, we moved back here and I thought, hmm, I'm gonna sort of check this town out again. And I talked to someone who was a friend 30 years ago and said, well, what's Chestertown like now? She said, it's totally different from what it was when you first came here. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, there are just really cool things going on. There's all this art and music and a lot of activity, social action going on. And I said, hmm, that sounds pretty good to me. So when we moved here, we hadn't intended to come as early as we did. We came the week of COVID just for my husband's spring break from his school and we stayed. So we did not go back. 
to Northern Virginia. We stayed and we're now a part of this community. One of the things that I wanted to do when I moved to Chestertown was to get involved in the community. And I thought, well, how am I gonna do that? And I thought about the Unitarian Church. So I started coming to this church with my brother-in-law, John Ramsey. Now, I don't know how many of you know John. <laughs> John used to be the most cynical person I knew. And suddenly John did a total turnaround to me, totally amazing to me in coming to this church and then getting very active. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. I really better check out this church. So I started coming and by coming, I mean, sitting on our couch in the living room, watching YouTubes where John and I would sit next to each other and we would sing quietly the hymns together where the rest of the family would be around the room. And then over time, as the church got to be open to us sitting here again, I started to connect with people. And that was one of my goals is I wanted to get into the community. And this church makes that so easy. The things that this church are into and supporting in the community are just right there. Everybody's already doing it. I don't have to be the organizer I was 30 years ago. I can just slide right in. And that means a lot to me. The transition has been very easy. One other thing that I wanted was to get a very close group of women as a support group for myself. I had one for 15 years in North Virginia, and it was very painful to give that up. So I said, all right, I'll just start one here. And this week, um, six or seven women have all agreed to come together and we can meet in this church. That means a lot to me. I don't have to go out and find a place to meet and do we pay them or do we not pay them? My immediate thought was, I wonder if the church is open. And it is. And it's way open for a lot of time. So we're not just supporting us here on Sundays or the community at large, but we're giving this place as an opportunity for other people to be here. So that's sort of my story. So today I'm wearing the stewardship committee hat and we're talking about sort of interchange, interchangeably using the word pledge and stewardship. I'd never heard stewardship used before on a pledge campaign. So of course I looked it up in the dictionary, just like you looked up generosity. And stewardship actually is, according to this dictionary, the responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the valuables of others. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean to this church? The first value to me is our people, our staff of one. I don't consider it a staff of one because I consider at least one and a half or one and three quarters with Sue. Then we have the physical part of this church. We talked about the sanctuary, building the sanctuary. We talked about the memorial garden. We talked about all of the beautiful grounds we have around here. That's the second part of our stewardship to support. And the third part Sue mentioned, our community. We support our community of Chestertown and beyond. And it does need money to do that. So it's our job to support these ideas, support the mission of this church, to support each other. And we've seen that, we heard that. Another little thing that I'd like to say, which is part of my church sort of ritual is I cry a lot in church. For some reason, when I come in the door of a church, it doesn't matter what the sermon is, something touches me and I start to cry. So Carl, you did that today. Thank you very much. Um, so here we are. We have the stewardship campaign kicked off today. Hopefully you've already gotten your pledge letter in the mail and you've thought about it. And we're very fortunate in that the campaign actually already started, not just today. We already have had some of the pledges come in and we have reached 25% of our pledge goal already in the first week, which to me is pretty amazing. We have about four weeks more to go and we're gonna track our progress by the wonderful little poster that Jackie made in the hall. 
there's a heart and every time we get a nice chunk, we're gonna put another little heart inside the heart. And our goal is to fill that heart. And we might even have to have some oozing outside the heart when we exceed our goal. So when you return your cards, your pledge cards, and we hope that you do that soon, realize that this is an expression of your faith, hope, and optimism in the future of this church and our community. This church is a very valuable part of the community and hopefully in each of your lives. So we need to hold our center in these trying times, which is our theme of this stewardship campaign and help each other stay strong as we go through the times that are before us. The last thing that I wanna mention is some people wanna know the real specifics of where does our money go? So Jim Lavin is gonna share the budget after this meeting. He's gonna do it on Zoom. So the folks on Zoom can also listen, watch and ask questions. And in addition, he's made a YouTube that's gonna be available if you wanna sit and ponder where the money goes and you wanna say, I wanna support that, then those details will be given in that YouTube. I think it's kind of cool that it's not necessarily the treasurer of the church, but it's a committee member that's doing that presentation. It just shows me how active the committees are in this church. It's not a group of mystery people meeting behind closed doors. It's the people in this room that are carrying the church. So I wanna thank you all for participating in the church and the future of the church and hopefully keeping us all together as a congregation. Gratitude, Catherine and the whole stewardship pledge team. It is a new team and they are doing phenomenal work. I'm going to now offer our closing words. We'll extinguish the chalice. We will have a familiar benediction. And then Joe says, please just get up and start moving around. The postlude will happen. Our closing words today are from Kimberly Quinn Johnson. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are not perfect, but we are perfectly fitted for this day. We are not without fault, but we can be honest to face our past as we chart a new future. We are the ones we have been waiting for. May we be bold and courageous to chart that new future. May we have faith in a future that is not known. We are 
the ones we have been waiting for. We now extinguish our chalice. I can hold it. Yeah, that's a, you do one job because we don't want you to fall. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. taking piano lessons he was given that music this morning for go lift it up joe thank you so much our service our service is over as we have a little bit of energetic music to leave by and carl all our best we love you take care everybody